everybody. Um, I'm here today to talk about game design and business models and how they intersect. And uh, because I've been doing this for a long time, I'm going to talk a lot about business models uh, over the years and how, they're, how they've been evolving and changing. Um, my company, Hero Engine, just to give you uh, some quick background so that you have some, uh, some reason to believe I have some clue what I'm talking about. Um, we offer a 3D engine for online games. We do uh, MMOs like the Star Wars, The Old Republic, which was uh, started on our technology. Um, we do social games like we have a Farmville prototype game built in 3D. Uh, and people are developing these games in the cloud. So I'm not, gonna, I'm not here to give you a commercial. In fact, almost none of what I'm talking about today is anything that I can sell you. Um, so unlike some of those other guys, but uh, um, basically I've been doing online games for longer than almost everybody. I'm, I'm be willing to bet that nobody in this room has been doing it longer than me. Uh, my first job involving online games was at Genie, which was part of General Electric starting in 1988. You believe that there were online games in 1988? Uh, my modem at home is 300,000 times faster than the modem that I used to get on my first online game back then. Um, and then I went to Simutronics, which was a, an early online game company that I actually met because they were a provider on, uh, uh, on Genie. Uh, Simutronics alone had about 20% market share of Genie's games, mostly doing text-based mud-style games. Uh, we put those games on AOL, and suddenly we were doing $5 million a year, and this was about 1996. Um, and that was just our share of the revenue. AOL was doing a lot more, and I'll actually show you that. And, uh, then Simutronics ended up building an engine that was built for our own game and we started selling it to other people. So at this point we have something like 3,500 teams building games on Hero Engine in the cloud. So I've seen a lot of games over the years, ours and other people's, and I've seen what a lot of people are developing, and I'm going to try to share you some insight. So one thing that I wish my father had told me when I was a young person, never fall in love with your business model. Okay, Your business model will leave you and leave you fickle, bro they're fickle, they'll leave you brokenhearted and broke, all right? I've seen business models come and go. I told you a minute ago that at Simutronics, we were doing $5 million a year on AOL. We were doing it on a business model that then, one, in 1997, in October, went away. And suddenly, we had to figure out how to make our games work with an entirely new business model. So I guarantee you that whatever business model you're working with today, if you're still in the business in five years, is likely to be very, very different. So here are some business models I have loved over the years. Uh, the pay-by-the-minute pay business model, uh, which was common in the online services in the 90s. You were online, you were spending $3 an hour, and the clock ticked every minute, and they charged you a nickel. Um, then the market shifted very quickly in the late 90s to a monthly subscription model. It started out at $10 a month. It gradually evolved. Now most of the big games are at $15 a month. I'm giving you prices in dollars because you could probably tell I'm an American. So your, your mileage may vary here. Um, another business model that's fairly common that has survived over the years, but for a very small number of online games, is the one that the publishers like, where you buy a box and then you don't pay any more money. Um, and then the newest model that has evolved is microtransactions. I really like this model for a lot of reasons that I'll talk about in a minute. But again, don't fall in love too deeply, because chances are somebody will come up with something even more clever as we go forward. Now, it's important as game designers to think about business models, because they have an impact on everything that you do. Um, they impact your game design very directly. They also will impact your audience size potential. If you were to release a game today that was sold by the minute, I would imagine that you would have a very small audience compared to a lot of other types of games. That audience would probably be very devoted. The average revenue per paying user would probably be very high, but you wouldn't have a lot of them. Uh, and the, game, the business model will also affect your demographics, or your demographics will affect your business model. They're tied very closely together. So issues for game designers to think about. I'm not going to beat most of these to death because you've heard them in other talks and in your day jobs and whatever. Time versus money. Um, five years ago, a, a wonderful thing happened. I had a little boy uh, come into my life, my little son, and suddenly I stopped playing World of Warcraft. All right, and why did I, did I suddenly hate World of Warcraft because I had a child? No, I just didn't have time to play. And if you don't spend many, many hours playing an, uh, an MMO game, you just can't really compete. I tried to get back into it a few years ago when he was older and I, and I had a little more time, and I don't even remember how to play. I've got a 45th level mage and I have no idea how to cast spells anymore. It's pitiful. 
Um, so I play a lot of casual games because I have less time. Now, if I go in and play a game, since I have less time, I'm willing to spend more money, because fortunately I still have some of that left. He's not in college yet. Uh, advancement speed versus content production, okay? If, you, if players move fast, then your job is much harder because you have a lot more work to do. You have to build more content for them to play. So there's a, a lot of different factors that have to be balanced in order to make things work. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the buy the box, but you know, if you play Battlefield or Guild Wars, you go online, there's a server, you've paid for the box, and basically your online time is free. Sometimes there's a little downloadable content where they can try to gouge you for a little extra money. Publishers like this because it fits their strengths. Publishers started off years ago, built a business where they could ship a lot of boxes from a warehouse into stores and into your, into your home. Um, it's easy for them, but it's not a great model, I don't think, for a lot of reasons. One is there's no recurring revenue. And this is a, this is a model where if you're not making recurring revenue, you're missing the boat. Um, if you want recurring revenue, you have to either release many expansions. And Guild Wars originally had talked about doing an expansion, a new box every month or every quarter, and they just couldn't keep up and couldn't do it. Uh, or downloadable content, it's the same thing. It's a lot of extra work in a, in a game like that. Another way to keep your game, uh, to, to the drawback is that they end up being arena games where it's all player versus player. Personally, I don't have the reflexes I did when shooters first came out, so I can't really compete with the average 15-year-old who can spend a lot more time and whose nerve endings move faster and they've been drinking Red Bull. So, uh, so it's only going to get the hardcore players. You're going to limit your audience by that uh, factor. The other thing is, because they tend to be peer-to-peer, -peer, um, there's usually no server involved except for a matchmaking service. Uh, they're much more prone to hacking and cheating than, uh, than uh, other kinds of online games. So typically, the publishers don't care that much. They do a little bit to, to fight it, but overall, you end up with the hardest core players or the biggest cheaters ending up doing the best, and it leaves out the rest of us. Now, coming back to the, play by the pay by the minute model, I want to spend more time talking about models that you probably haven't experienced, um, just because you haven't, because that way I know more than you do, and it makes me feel good. Um, no, actually, I think there's some interesting insights here. The one thing I really loved about this model was that the more fun you were having in the game, the more time you've spent playing. And the more time you spent playing, the more money that you paid. So there was a direct correlation between fun and money. That was beautiful. And interestingly, I'm, as my uh, uh, coworker here uh, knows, I keep, every, I keep every data file that I, I can get my hands on on my hard drive. This is actually a data set of uh, usage of a game called Gemstone 3, one of Simutronic's biggest success games uh, from March of 1996. Uh, total revenue ended up being about a little more than double this uh, over the course of the next year. So that game did about 50,000 hours a month of play at uh, totaling about, I'm sorry, we had 50,000 users a month playing at this time. At $6 an hour back then, it was $3 million a month of use of this one game. Um, AOL kept 80% of that revenue, so we didn't get that much, but it was still a, a good business. Um, this graph is drawn so that over here is the guy who spent the most money that month and how much money they spent. So you see that 80% of the revenue of the game came from 20% of the users. The 80-20 rule is like a miracle. It just always works. The thing is that at the peak, the top user spent 400 hours a month play, playing the game, which was a lot of money at $6 an hour, right? over a couple thousand dollars. The other thing that's amazing about that statistic is there are only 700 hours in a month. OK? And out of those 700, you're probably going to spend a couple hundred sleeping. So most waking hours, the, the, the top 100 players spent almost every waking hour in this game, one way or another. We're just imagining people you know, slipping pizzas under the door and things like that. Um, so obviously, this is a model that rewards people who are spending a lot of time. And that's one of the reasons that it's not sustainable is people were, were having a great time and then they got their credit card bill at the end of the month. We used to call that credit card meltdown. So it was a, it was a wonderful thing, and they were having the greatest time ever. They were advancing through the ranks, and then you never saw them again. Because then they had to explain to their wife or their mom why they spent $2,000 on AOL last month. Um, 
So inside our company, we said, gee, this is great. The more time we keep people online, the more money we make. So we invented some game mechanics that actually sucked. Um, and for example, we said, gee, the longer they spend online, the better it is for us because we make more money. So we'll make it farther to get from a place that they are to a place that they want to be. And it'll take longer. All right. Um, the interesting thing is that this became so ingrained in people's minds who were playing these games that when a, a next generation of games with an entirely different business model came out, when EverQuest came out with a monthly subscription where time wasn't an issue in making money, they still assumed that that was a good thing. So it took years, it took games like World of Warcraft to figure out that, wait a minute, all this, these terrible game mechanics, that they don't exist for a good reason anymore. And in fact, it wasn't a good reason either. It made the game less fun. Um, slowed down the healing rate so that you had to go somewhere and, and lick your wounds for a half an hour in order to go back and fight some more. Um, one of our games actually separated uh, training from combat. So in other words, you, didn't, you, you progressed in one little narrow skill area in combat, and then while you were waiting for your wounds to heal, you were also taking lessons in other skills that were important for you to advance. Or you were just taking lessons because that's the only way you could build up the skills. Um, the other thing is the early games tended to be very punishing of players. We'd constantly, I don't know what it was about the Game Masters. They were, I don't know if it was because they were trying to make more money uh, by killing players or they just thought that was what you were supposed to do. But uh, the, there were a lot of very punishing game mechanics. So what I will consider the number one game design cheat in online games from that day to today is that by slowing player progress, it means that designers have to work less hard which means the companies spend less money, but time playing the game becomes less fun. And I'll digress from the slide for a second and say this. Um, despite what the, the previous speaker said, I have an MBA, and uh, I actually got it after I was in the industry, so hopefully it makes me uh, you know, less evil. Um, but um, we did a, did a project at the school where I had a team of students and a marketing professor and we did a gigantic survey. We had thousands of, P of MMO players take the survey and we did an analysis of um, what, we were trying to determine what types of players were out there and what features of, of games different players liked. And I'll talk more about that later on in the, in the presentation. Um, but as we discovered, 50% of the reason why players liked one game over another was what? Nope. Good though. Now I'll tell you the answer. It's, it was more fun. Okay, brilliant insight, right? <laughs> but basically, the reason that people at that point, World of Warcraft had completely dominated the industry, and the reason they played World of Warcraft was World of Warcraft was just more fun. World of Warcraft threw away some of these crappy game mechanics that didn't exist for a good reason, and just made the game more fun. And over time, they've tried to focus on that more and more and more. So. That's the real key, is if you think of a great idea that will make more money, make sure that it also is fun. It seems obvious, but if you focus too much on the money, and I've got an MBA, I'm telling you this, uh, it's still important. If the game isn't fun, they're not gonna stick around. The um, thing I don't like about the subscription model is that revenue has a floor and a ceiling. By a floor, I mean nobody's gonna spend less than the subscription price, and by a ceiling, I mean they're not gonna spend more than the subscription price, okay? So which means that somebody that might find the game amusing but only has a spare hour a month is unlikely to pay the subscription fee because the cost per hour is really low, is really high. And the other way around, if somebody really loves your game and they're going to spend 400 hours in the game, that's all the money you get. And there's revenue left on the table on both of those situations. Um, so... One thing we did to solve this when we went to a subscription model, we realized we had people who were willing to spend thousands of dollars playing our game. So we did all sorts of things. I'll just list a couple. One is we came up with a premium subscription tier. We charged, instead of $15 a month, we charged $40 a month if you had a subscription that was premium. What did we give you for that? Mostly intangible things. Of course, it's virtual world, so everything's more or less intangible, but even more, we gave you, instead of only having one character slot, you had 10 character slots. You had double the inventory space you got a 10% discount on premium uh, item uh, sales. You got uh, early admission to any in-game quests and events and so on, things like that, that we thought that the, the, the most active players would really like. 35% of our audience ended up going for that. 
We also had special event tickets. We'd create a quest that players would take all weekend playing, and the first week we would offer it, it would be 100 bucks, and we'd sell out. And the second weekend, it would be 100 bucks, and we'd sell out, and when we stopped selling out, we'd lower the price. And somebody that was willing to wait two months could get the same quest for $25, but it was all about trying to raise ARPU. So a $15 a month game became $27 a month. And again, as the last speaker said, as you raise your ARPU, what it means is you're really catering to a niche audience. So the higher you go here, that means that the narrower the audience that you end up having. So with subscription games, if you slow down your players, you end up in a grind. Uh, if you need a gigantic world so they have lots of play, places to explore, it's really expensive. Um, if you decide to go for a PVP uh, orientation, which is interesting and fun and keeps players around for a long time because there's a lot of players and they entertain each other, uh, it means you have less content, but it narrows the, the audience down to PVP type people. So let's talk about microtransactions a little bit. And this is one where I'm not going to beat this to death because you've been hearing about microtransaction business models for the last several hours. Um, you know, it's, it's nice because there's a low hurdle rate. You can play for free. Hopefully you make the game easy enough where you can learn it for, uh, very quickly. Uh, people, uh, you know, the, the, the main thing that game designers have to worry about here is balancing paid goods, uh, paid goods with fairness. You don't want to be able to buy your way to t the top. That really irritates some of the audience. Um, speed versus convenience, vanity items, new areas, and things like that. So now let me make a modest proposal. I think that people are, not, are still leaving money on the table. And uh, as an MBA, I have to say that's the most terrible thing in the world. Um, there's ways to make more money because people don't understand how to price virtual goods very well. So I'm going to make a modest proposal and show you a technique that I've used several times in my career. I used it at Genie to reprice the entire Genie online service and take revenue from $10 million to $15 million a year literally overnight just by a pricing and bundling change. And uh, we used it in the study that I just referred to uh, at business school. The idea is it's called conjoint analysis. And I'm not going to teach you everything that you need to know about conjoint analysis. But if you're interested in this after the talk, just do a Google search. And you'll find companies and software packages and things like that that can do this. Here's an example of how to do conjoint. Okay? You ask somebody uh, to take a survey, or in a game, you could actually say, would you like to buy this or this? But make them pick one or the other and not say, I want to buy all five of these things. Uh, here's an example in the computer industry. And this is probably an old example because these specs of these systems are a little bit, uh, I wouldn't buy any of them today. Um, but you have a computer, you have a brand name as the first characteristic, the speed of the processor, uh, the amount of memory, the size of the monitor, and a price point. So th these are all separate factors. You ask people uh, which of these they want, or none of the above. Or in a game, you could choose a set of attributes, how much damage something does, how much XP you get, whatever it might be. Uh, and you define an item as a combination of attributes. Okay. And now if you heard Richard, Richard Bartle speak or have read his book, he divides MMO players into these four categories. All right, what we discovered when we did our research in MMO players is we basically reinvented Bartle. One of the things we did was we find that the audience segmented itself into different groups who like different things. So the achievers, they want to, they want to be the high, highest level guy out there or the fastest. The explorers want to discover all the new cool stuff that you put in your world. The socializers want to be the head of the guild and, and uh, manage all the other people. And the killers, you know, you know what, the, and probably most of you are killers. Most of us who work in the business are. So here's just an example of the result that you could get from doing a conjoint analysis on, uh, the, once you've segmented the audience and you, you find that, the, that different attributes have different values to different segments. So let's say that if you just did an A-B test on an item, you would probably say that if you sold this, uh, this item for $8, everybody would buy it. You would sell the most quantity of it. The thing is that by changing attributes on an item, you would find an item that all the other groups would find to be worth spending more money on. And the cool thing is with online games today, especially free-to-play games, your audience is so massive that this data could be generated in no time at all if you just built the, the right survey components into it. You do the, you basically, 
offer the choice one day, and now you have all the information you need to price these objects. What I would end up doing in this game is I would say, well, okay, this one for explorers is clearly the maximum I can get from explorers. Now let's see if there's some other combination of attributes where I can get socializers to buy an item for $11 and killers to buy an item for $11. There's probably, these are just three attributes. There's probably 10 other attributes. Basically the idea here is by using conjoint, which is very well studied. It was developed at uh, University of Pennsylvania originally, but uh, it was used by, um, uh, the Marriott Courtyard Hotels, when they say the hotel that was invented by business travelers, well, business travelers didn't actually invent it. They did conjoint surveys to find out what business travelers wanted in a hotel that was different from leisure travelers. Okay, but it's a very powerful technique that can tell you the value of an item. So right now, when people are doing virtual goods, they're typically saying, okay, well, a potion is going to be one gold piece. And then they start doing A-B tests and maybe a, gold, a, a potion should be two gold pieces. But this is a way to segment the audience, to offer items that are going to be attractive to the player. The thing is this, it does two things that I really like. One is, it gives the player something they really value. They really value it because, it, because it, it matches up with their interest in the game, so it makes the game more fun. And what makes it more fun for me with the MBA is that it makes more money. So it, it's all, it, it's, it's, a game design solution that actually makes things better, which is hard to find. So with that, I'm going to stop talking and take questions. I'm happy to talk about the dark ages of AOL and Genie or any of this stuff if you like. Uh, and uh, I'm not doing a commercial, but if you want to check out our cool stuff on HeroEngine.com, that would be fun too. All right, thanks. Neil, thank you very much.